to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're talking about this, that, and the other thing. The other thing, of course, being determiners. But first, we met our recent Patreon goal to do a live show. Yay, live show! I'm excited. We will have more news for you about where and when that live show is going to be, but stay tuned. Thanks to everyone who helped us meet this goal, all of our fabulous patrons who make these main episodes happen ad-free and available for everyone, and who, of course, as a thank you from us, get a bonus episode every month as well. And if you're a patron, you'll also have seen the advance announcement that, since we've also met our art goal uh, a while Yay, back... Yay, art goal! Yay, art goal! We now have preview art up on Patreon, which you can see a sample sketch. And we're announcing here that the theme for this art is Space Babies. Space Babies! We are so excited. Space Babies have been with us since episode one, where we talked about what would happen on the International Space Station, given that they speak both Russian and English as their daily languages, uh, if we sent a whole bunch of babies to space to grow up. Yes, if all the astronauts and cosmonauts started having babies together, what would happen to the babies? So we have an international array of cute babies floating in space. Very unethically, we are not sending any actual babies to space, but they're very cute when they're cartoons <laughs> versions. We just couldn't get the ethics. <laughs> to be honest, we didn't try to get the ethics. <laughs> we knew we couldn't do that. We've talked about space babies in a couple of other episodes, and of course we always love to chat about just how great language learners' babies are. So we're very happy to have some cute little mascots for the show, and we'll be launching merch with those very soon. And this has been one of our most popular quotes with you, the listeners, all the way through. So you will get to wear or have stickers of small, cute babies very soon. And you can see this preview and listen to two new bonus episodes, one about forensic linguistics and another about homonyms by becoming a patron. Okay, Gretchen, it's time to determine who knows the most determiners. Are you ready? This is not a competition, but, you know, I love framing things as a competition. <laughs> uh, it's a competition. It's on. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to start with the. Oh, damn, you chose the easy one. I'm going to go with ah. Uh. My. This. Your. That. Her. It's. His. Many. Their. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got all, I did all the possesses. I'm sorry. It's really easy. <laughs> That's very possessive of you, Gretchen. Our. Some. A. Uh, three. And also Anne, because Anne is just kind of the same one. Okay, you get half a point for Anne, because I had a. Uh. <laughs> uh, those. Four. These. Five. Some. Six. Okay, if you're going to do numbers, we can be here all day. Seven. Like, until eternity. Eight. Nine. Okay. Nine. Yeah, we have literally okay, an okay, infinite okay. number of determiners ahead of us. This is it's probably not going to make for a good episode if it's just me counting to infinity. I think we need to declare it a tie because we can't count who knows the most infinity yeah. numbers. And it's a good conclusion. Thanks for playing our game. Yeah. Determiners determined. Determiner determiner game. Uh, but determiners are really cool. And there are a lot of them, and I know when I learned about them, it kind of blew my mind that all of these different things that I thought of as different kinds of parts of speech actually had this hidden thing in common. Yeah, so even though that sounded like a grab bag of words that you think of as coming from different categories like numbers and possessive pronouns and articles and things that you've talked about as different parts of speech, if you've ever done any grammar, are actually part of the same group of things called determiners. And it's like discovering that all of these people that you thought were really cool all have something in common that makes them even cooler? Like, they all have a mutual friend with you. Or, in my case, it's like discovering that all your friends are all also left-handed, because this happens to me periodically. It's like, you're left-handed too! Great! Or it's like when I discover that a bunch of my friends are vegetarian, and I'm like, yes! Dinner parties at my house! <laughs> I will still come to your dinner parties, even though I'm not vegetarian. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Tolerant carnivore. <laughs> omnivore. But that's like, you know, there are some omnivores who will turn up to the party and they might be doing different things at other parties sometimes, but they're very happy to be vegetarians at my parties. And that is kind of like determiners, these parts of speech that might have other jobs as well, but they have this job as well. 
Yeah, and what I really like about determiners is that they're these tiny little words and they can really drastically change the course of a story you're talking about just by influencing the perspective or the relationship that you have with the main noun in the sentence. So if you start with a story like, I was walking home last night and I saw a cat. So far, great story. Oh, it's a, good, it's a good story. Any story with the cat's a good story. But so far, it's a pretty straightforward story. Nothing surprising here. But it's, cl but it's clearly a cat you don't know, yeah. or you think you don't know at this point in the story. If I, But if I say I was walking home last night and I saw the cat... Oh my god, your cat got out and then you saw it. So maybe that's my cat, but maybe that's just like the cat of doom. Mm. Or like, I was walking home last night and I saw that cat. <laughs> Oh, has it been scratching up all of your plants again? That darn cat. Um, or if I say I was walking home last night and I saw your cat. Oh, I mean, that's surprising given that you live in a different city and I don't have a cat, but, you know. <laughs> we live in different continents. Like, your cat is a good swimmer. <laughs> I was walking home last night and I saw many cats. Oh, lucky you. Well, but depends on how many. I was walking home last night and I saw a million cats. I was walking home last night and I saw at least ten cats. <laughs> like this is, I, I'm scared now. Like you know that thing about would you rather fight yeah. uh, a horse-sized duck or a thousand duck-sized horses? Yes. Like a million cats is just I don't want to fight them. <laughs> no. And I don't even think like I want them all to sit on my lap because I think I'd be crushed. Yes, that is a lot of fluff. Yeah. So what's interesting about determiners is they can, you know, all of these, these, this was the same story except for the determiner. And it's really having a huge influence in terms of what happened and the relationship between the noun cat and the rest of the sentence of the rest of the story in terms of like it determines which cat I'm talking about or which being another determiner or what kind of relationship that cat has to the sentence as a whole. I always think of determiners as like a really important reality check in terms of semantics. Like we often think about like whether it was a cat or a dog, like that part of the meaning is really important. It's like, well, that part is, but the determiner is the part that makes it clear just how real it is if it's a hypothetical cat, if it's a real dog, if it's a my cat or my dog. And especially it tells us things like whether it's been previously mentioned in conversation. Like if I say I saw a cat or I saw the cat, if I say I saw the cat, that, that implies that it's been mentioned somehow before. It's an aforementioned cat or it's a cat that's been previously relevant. Or if I say I saw this cat versus I saw that cat, those cats are at different distances from me. Um, or, you know, do you, want, do you want this book or that book? The this book is closer and the that book is further away. I like to think about this proximity distinction a lot because English has squandered the opportunity to have yet another proximity distinction because we used to have yon or yonder as part of the regular vocabulary, which was like further away than that. And so I could say, tell me about yon cat. And that would be like, tell me about the cat that's all the way over there in the story that you're telling. That would be great. I think we should bring back yon. We should bring back the far distal demonstrative. I'm into it. You know, I was walking home last night and I saw a yawn cat. <laughs> well, I mean, it was the size of a horse, so it was pretty easy to see. That's why I could see it from so far yeah. away. And there are some languages that still have these distinctions. I think Portuguese is a language that has... Yeah, I know Spanish does. You can have, like, ese gato and aquelo gato, or aquel gato, I think. Yeah. And you can have a distinction between essa which is like near you in Portuguese, but you can have aquela, which is like over there away from both of us, which in terms of like asking people to fetch cake for you, which is a context I think about a lot, like <laughs> distinguishing between the cake that's near you and the cake that is like further away on the table and not near either of us. Like English doesn't do that very elegantly. I think it's really important, you know, if you're going to a bakery or something and you're looking behind the glass and you're saying, yeah, I want like three of these and three of those and three of yawn. Yeah the cakes over yonder. <laughs> so English, even though it has a lot of distinctions, we're still missing out on some good semantics. Yeah, and some languages don't have this distinction between a uh and the at all, really. Like some languages do just fine without it, and it's clear based on the discourse which one is there. So one of the other cool things that I really like about determiners is that they can let us do like a lot of these little little tiny parts of speech, these little words that are kind of the glue between the big 
important, you know, content words that have all this very vivid drawable or picturable or pointable meaning. You know, you can draw a picture of a cat, you can't draw a picture of a the or of a this. <laughs> I mean, maybe you want to try. <laughs> I'd like to see someone try, but like, I don't know what's in that picture. <laughs> And so when you're thinking about the type of things that can be pictured, one of the things that lets us bring in and integrate new words or nonsense words or fake words or be really creative with language is these little building blocks that tell us when we're bringing in a new fake word what we're actually trying to do with that word. So it's not just an entire string of gibberish, it's gibberish that sounds like it could be kind of Englishy, which is a really interesting halfway point. And it does this by leveraging things like determiners. Yeah, and determiners are a huge part of this. So if you have a poem like Jabberwocky, which is a great poem. Good old Jabberwocky. I mean, I give this I give this to my students and I say, well, how do you know what part of speech wabe is? Because wabe is not a real word. So this is a poem by Lewis Carroll, which begins, "'Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe." So it's Englishy. It's got some English in there. There's an and, and there's a the, and there's a did, and there's an in. But there's also all these words that aren't English. Brillig and slithy and toves and gyre and gimble and wabe. And yet we know that if you say twas brillig, that the brillig there is going to be an adjective. And the slithy toves, slithy is also going to be an adjective, but tove has got to be a noun. Yeah. And the reason we know that is because of the the there. And similar with the wabe. There's only one wabe in the Jabberwocky. There's not a million wabes. Yeah, and you know that because of the the. Yeah. And it creates, if you said twas brillig and some slithy toves did gyre and gibble in a wabe. You'd be like, oh, just one of those common wabes. Yeah, we've all got one. Exactly. So it really kind of creates a different attitude and perspective of the speaker. It's like, okay, this thing is common knowledge. We don't know what a wabe is, but we know it's a thing that is previously mentioned in the discourse or that there's only one of. The way you might say the sea or the ocean rather than a puddle. Of course, Jabberwocky's all well and good, but I like to use snack memes as my diagnostic tool. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the meme with the snakes in it. And snakes, of course, like all animals in picture memes on the internet, talk really funny. Yes. And they're particularly good at making things nouns that aren't supposed to be nouns. Yeah. Or that weren't originally nouns. So the classic snake sentence that I always think of when I think of the snake meme is, heck off, you're doing me a frighten. And there are a few others that we have from Snackville here. So, I do a flat. I am much venom. Snack ned a boopings. I'm doing a protect. And so all of these you have a frighten. Frighten normally in English is a verb, but here the a uh is what's making it into a noun. And you parse it as a noun, and that's what makes it work. But the determiner is really what's telling you. It's kind of the traffic signals or the streets that your, you know, noun and verb cars kind of run down. Yeah. That tell them where to go. Yeah. And the same thing with much venom. The much there, another determiner, is telling you, okay, venom here, which would be a noun, is now actually, I guess, kind of... It's a different kind, a different kind, of, kind of noun, noun. Yeah. It's changing the flavor of the noun. Yeah. Or snack need a boopings. You know, you don't really put ah with a plural noun, boopings. Because ah uh, is one specific thing. Yeah. There's a lot of things there that, like, the thing that makes snack an interesting and creative meme is that it has the determiners telling you, here's why these nouns and these adjectives and stuff sound weird. I like that you pointed out when we were assembling our mini snack corpus for the episode that um, snack is really obsessed with the use of a uh, rather than the. Mm. Yeah, so snack doesn't say, you're doing me the frighten, or I do the flat, like I do the twist, or snack need the boopings, I'm doing the protect. Those don't sound very snack-like to me. No, there's something about the indeterminate. Everything is possible for snack. Everything is multitudes. Yeah, whereas I think of earlier memes, especially kind of the lolcat memes that often used the respelled the as te, yep. T-E-H. Well, I think it's just because the the as te was so much more salient because it was graphically irregular that it yeah. kind of seems much more prominently cat. So I think of, yeah, I think of te as cats and uh as snack now. <laughs> so each each animal meme gets its own characteristic determiner. Well, and, and we can even think of like the Doge meme, which has like, wow, such meme. Doge was very obsessed with such and much and these like quantifying. And, and many. Yeah. Yeah. All these quantifier determiners. So yeah, like they tend to draw on a characteristic set of determiners, which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah. Do me such frighten would be more dogey. Yeah. And like do me te frighten might be more lolcatty. Yeah. 
Gosh, imagine if Lewis Carroll was alive in the time of animal memes. Right. <laughs> I feel like Jabberwocky is already almost a meme. If you put that on some images, it would kind of look meme-like. <laughs> And I think you can even see, so we did an episode a little while back about the wug test. So the wug test is you show people a picture of this cute little, you know, nonsense animal and you say, this is a wug. Now there are two of them, there are two, and you leave open that space for them to fill in um, two wugs, which is how you know people can generalize the plural to words they've never heard before, even little kids. Yeah. But the thing that makes that test possible is that we have certain expectations and certain relationships with determiners. This is a wug. So here's a new piece of information to you. You haven't necessarily seen one of these before. And then saying, now there are two of them. There are two, you know, numbers are also determiners. So there are two fills in, okay, you want to say this again. You want to say this down again. I wonder if you could mess up kids doing the test by saying, this is the wug. Hmm. Because if you say this is the wug and imply that there's like one, saying there are two could potentially confuse them. Yeah, that's interesting. Because there are some things that, can you do this? Because I'm thinking like there are some proper names that you can say like the Flash for a superhero, but I don't think you can say like now there are two of them. There are two yeah. the Flashes? The Flashes. Like, what if the Flash was in some sort of, like, clone, <laughs> evil twin, weird movie where there was a second The Flash? Are they now called The Flashes? Or, like, how does that work? The Flashes. It sounds like a really bad band <laughs> or a spate of petty criminals. <laughs> this is my band, like, The Flashes. <laughs> um, yeah, so the WUG test also relies on determiners in a really low-key way, but it's still really important for it. Yeah. And this kind of brings us into determiners and how they interact with names of people or names of places and other types of proper nouns that are unique and singular. Yeah. So we've said so far that determiners, you just whack them on a noun and it's all good. But there are a bunch of nouns that they don't work. They don't work too good with. <laughs> and proper nouns are definitely those. So people names and place names. Yeah. Like, I am not the Gretchen. I don't think anyone can <laughs> Welcome to Lingthusiasm. I'm the Gretchen McCulloch. <laughs> but you are the Gretchen of Lingthusiasm. <laughs> but someone could ask if you're the Gretchen from all things linguistic. That's true. Yeah. Like, are you the Gretchen that's on Lingthusiasm? Are you some other Gretchen? I think maybe it's easier with your name, Lauren, because Lauren is a far more common name. Well, yeah, I am definitely a Lauren. Like, I talk about being a linguist Lauren on Twitter and how much I love all the other linguist Laurens. I, I know many linguist Laurens. And saying someone, you know saying in the 2000s that someone was a real Britney. Mm. It takes on a kind of adjectival property of that name being very trendy at that time and having certain connotations and extra meanings. Yeah, like a Britney is definitely different from a Karen. Yes. You have different associations between those. Um, so I read this really weird short story called And Then There Were N-1 by Sarah Pinksker. Hang on. And Then There Were N-1? Yeah. It's a pun on like the Agatha Christie story and then there were was one. Okay. And the premise of the story, I guess this is a spoiler. It's a great story though, you should read it. I won't spoil the ending. Okay. I'll just spoil the premise partway through. So the author is Sarah Pinsker and she kind of involves herself as a character in this story. So she gets a mysterious letter that says, We have discovered the theory of multiple universes, such that every decision that anybody has ever made has created like a proliferation of universes. Yeah. And we're inviting you to a convention with all of the other Sarah Pinskers. Oh, so she's just a Sarah Pinsker. Right. And so you're going to meet like the Sarah Pinsker that didn't move to Seattle, or you're going to meet the Sarah Pinsker that like didn't end up dating your girlfriend. Like you're going to meet all of these different other Sarah Pinskers. Yeah. And like some of the Sarah Pinskers have changed their last name, but they're still a Sarah. And so the story has a lot of her trying to identify the different Sarahs once she meets them, you know? So she's like, okay, so this is the Sarah that was wearing the band t-shirt, or this is the Sarah that was wearing the cute dress, or this is the Sarah that had her hair in a long braid. Yeah. Or she'll go into a room and she'll be like, well, there were seven Sarahs in the room. <laughs> Or like one Sarah said, and then another Sarah said. And so you're doing all of these determiner things to this proper name because suddenly Sarah has become a type rather than just a unique referent. Yeah. Sarah just sounds like any other noun right now. Yeah, right? Like you've totally semantically satiated on Sarah because it just doesn't even feel like it's a person's name anymore. And by the time I got to the end of this short story, which was very interesting in terms of like what it means, you know, interesting questions of identity, uh, 
yeah, so it was like, what do all of these Sarahs mean? And what does this mean about, you know, your ability to make these types of decisions? But grammatically, I also thought it was very interesting because you don't often get to have proper names being pluralized and the Sarah and a Sarah and one Sarah, another Sarah and these kinds of things. Certainly not sustainably. Yeah. So you have this whole short story where it does that. We'll link to it. It's a great short story. I find it interesting. We were talking about this briefly the other day when we were talking about this topic, how superhero names, and I couldn't find anything because this is definitely not my genre of popular entertainment, but if you have any links about the use of the or not in front of superhero names, it's kind of interesting because we have, you know, the Flash and the Phantom, but it would be really weird to have the Superman. (laughs) The Batman. (laughs) The Wonder Woman. (laughs) Well, I was actually also thinking of this in terms of other mythical creatures, because you have, like, Santa Claus, not the Santa Claus. But then you have... But you have the Easter Bunny. The Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy. Hmm. Santa, special status. Right. And all the reindeer, too. Like, you have Rudolph, not the Rudolph. (laughs) (laughs) The Mrs. Claus. (laughs) The Mrs. Claus. I guess you have the elves, because they don't have unique identities, but that's a little bit less distinctive. Yeah. All elves. Well, and the same thing goes for other types of kind of generic items. So you have, like, the internet, but something that people kind of make fun of sometimes is often older people who talk about, like, the Google or the Facebook. Well, the Facebook was the Facebook, and they made... Yeah, it was originally called the Facebook. They, the mysterious forces of branding and naming, were like, it's not cool, just make it Facebook. I was trying to think of any other, like, major companies that had the in them. I'm sure I'll think of one as soon as I stop trying to go for it. Like, you don't have, like, the Amazon <laughs> or, like, the Microsoft or, you know, the Coca-Cola. You have it, it, you, the Coca-Cola, the Pepsi. Doesn't really work. The McDonald's. I don't know if there are any that really do that. English isn't that big on putting determiners in front of proper nouns unless it's in sci-fi. And you do have sometimes thes in front of other words that that are just kind of generic. Like if you say the power went out. Yeah. It's the power. It's not a power. Like the electricity is out. <laughs> but it's a specific thing, but it's also kind of not. Yeah. And this is what makes languages always fun to learn, because what you do by default in one language and use determiners all over the place in one context, you might not in another language. Yeah, absolutely. Like in countries, most countries in English, you don't say you know, the Canada or the Australia. (laughs) Welcome to the Australia. It does not sound natural or native to my English speaker intuitions. No, but, you know, a few of them, like you say the United States or the United Kingdom, partly because those are, you know, compound phrases. Mm, Yeah. You don't say the Great Britain. No. Or, like, the England. And then you also have some, like, uh, Ukraine used to be known as the Ukraine, and now they're like, no, please call us just Ukraine because we want to be like all the other countries. But there are still a few countries like the Vatican or the Hague that go by thes. Uh, the Hague is a city. Is it a city? Okay, well, so there we go. So there are a few places like the Vatican and the Hague that are still using determiners in English, but it's definitely not a standard convention. Yeah, exactly. But in French, for example, you do put determiners in front of all your countries. So you have le Canada and la France and l'Australie and these kinds of things. So, you know, these are these like weird little subtle variations that even when a language seems like they have a direct equivalence, they get used slightly differently in different contexts. My favorite ridiculously complicated word having to do with determiners. Yeah, I've already used the word proximal in this episode, so you're going to beat me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a word that you only ever use because you can have it. And I've only ever seen linguists use it to be like, what a great word. <laughs> and I've never actually seen it in context where someone wasn't signposting how great a word it was. So like, definitely don't think you have to know this word to be a linguist, but like also a lot of linguists secretly like this word. Uh, and this word is anarthris. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Anarthris. Anarthris. And this means not having a the. Mmm. That's a really obscure word for saying this word doesn't have a the. (laughs) It's such a complicated word for such a simple concept. And so arthris, without the an, would be having a the, and anarthris would be not having a the. Anarthris also just sounds like a really great roller derby name for a linguist nerd. (laughs) Hi, my name is Anne. Anarthris? Yeah, done. So a context where you might use this, and the context where I recently saw this word was in Lynn Murphy's book, which we talked about in a recent episode, where she talks about how Americans will say, I'm in the hospital, and Brits will say, I'm in hospital. And so for Brits, 
hospital is an arthris. And for Americans, hospital is arthris. As in, you put a thaw there. <laughs> um, and you could do it with similar things like you go to school, you don't go to the school. Yeah. But you go to, like, the grocery store, which is a generic grocery store, even if you mean a specific one. That's a good word. Try use it in a sentence today. <laughs> <laughs> use it today. No one will understand you. <laughs> and then you, too, will get to explain what it means. Oh. <laughs> this is the thing that's always stopped me from getting any active use of the word, is I know no yep. one else would get it either. So, uh, we'll post a link to that in the show notes, so you also know how to spell it. Lynn's got this great point in her book where she talks about the in-hospital thing, and then she's like, it's an arthritis, and then she puts in brackets, a word which I only use because it's so great, and here's what it means. And I'm like, yeah, I, I see what you did yeah. there. I would have done the same thing. So we mentioned briefly that, you know, even English can't agree on when you use articles and determiners and when you don't use them. Uh, and that varies even more cross-linguistically, we saw with English and French. But I also like that different languages have different resources to draw on. And we talked about how determiners are this diverse group of words that can kind of be invited to the same party and hang out together and do a similar thing. And I think it's really interesting. If you've learnt a couple of languages, you might notice that some of the languages you speak have a distinct word that means the function of a or an, but some languages just co-opt their word for one in doing that. And um, Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, so Shuba is a language like that, the Tibeto-Burman language of Nepal that I work with. So if you want to refer to an indeterminate, so just any particular one of a thing, you would say gurichi, so one cat, and that does the same job as a without having to uh, invent a whole other word. I think there are a bunch of European languages that do that too, because I know yeah. French and Spanish do, and German does, so you have un chat or un gato or ein cat, eine katz, and those are all the same as the word for one in those languages. And there's a, there's a really great walls map, we've talked about the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures before, that shows where there are languages that has a distinct type determiner and languages that use the numeral one for that function. Oh, that's very cool. So we can click on this link and see a map of different coloured dots where the word for a is the same as the word for one and where it's different. Yeah. That's really neat. And the definite equivalent, so the the equivalent, is d, and that's the same as the word for this. Oh, okay. So they don't have a separate the and this, they just have this one form d. They have a, a distal and they have a somewhere between far and near as well, which is super cool. And what's really cool is that for the the equivalent, you say diguri or the cat. And in this case, the mm. determiner is before the noun. And with the number it was after, it was guri chi. So that cat one as a kind of literal translation. And it's really, again, a nice reminder that determiners can have such different functions and they can occur in different parts of the sentence in relation to the noun, but they still all have this same function. And there's a map of that too, of which languages have their word for, for this and their word for the is the same. Yeah. Thanks, Walls. <laughs> what I find is kind of the most interesting thing about determiners as a category is the way that they kind of unify a bunch of things that we think of as similar. And so Latin actually has this thing that's very similar to what's in, in Shuba, which is their word for this, which was ilud, ila, ilum in Latin, became the romance le, la, le, or el, los, las. Ah, I was going to say, they sound familiar. Yeah. And so the Latin word for this became the word for the in the Romance languages. Hmm. So this is a thing that happens like from language to language, even when they have no contact with each other and they've never heard of each other and they're nowhere near each other geographically. Yeah. This is just a trend that languages seem to have. And the same thing for, have you ever wondered why we have two forms, a and an? Yes, but it's because, I mean, I know the environments that they occur in, that an occurs before something vowel -y or something H-E, but that's a complicated historical complication. Yeah, but an is actually older than a, right? Ah, yeah. And the an that's in an is because it has the same root as the word one in English. Mm. I have the Edam Online links, as I always love to do, for a uh and the that I'll put in the show notes. So if you go to Edam Online and you look up the word one, you can see that it's it's the same root as only or alone or a tone, which is like at one, all one. Mm. And in the dialect form, good un or young un, 
that un is a one as well. But the one pronunciation came up later, and an was also a version of that. Yep. And so if you have own and an, you can hear how those are very similar to each other, mm. and they're from the same root. So English actually has that connection. But the thing that makes me the most excited about thinking about determiners as a group is that it helps explain a few things about how we use determiners. So if you have a word like the, you don't just go around saying the by itself in a sentence. Like you can't say, you know, I saw a cat and then the kept going on or something like that. Because that does not work. <laughs> you need a word, Gretchen. <laughs> it needs a noun there for support. But other determiners like this and that, they can act by themselves without support. So you can say, I saw this cat and then this kept going on. Uh, maybe that's not a particularly good sentence, but you know you can say like, you know, give me this book and then I'll I'll move this this here or something like that. Yeah. And so you can say, you know, like the title of this episode, this, that, and the other thing, the this and the that in that sentence can each refer to specific things without there being a noun there for support. And what's interesting is that the pronoun they in English comes into English from Old Norse, and it has the same origins as this and that and the. They're all related to each other in terms of like th that one, or those yep. ones, or these ones. All, all of those the forms are related to each other. So some theories of determiners group all pronouns together with determiners because a determiner by itself, at least the ones that can appear by themselves, like this and that and many, act a lot like pronouns as well. And other languages also seem to have this set of relationships between what some of the pronouns can be and what some of the, what we think of as articles or something can be. And so if we group them into this category of determiners, it actually explains, you know, why these seem to have these weird similarities with each other. It explains why everyone's at the same party. Yeah, it's like seeing into the, you know, the underpinnings or the behind the scenes view of, of language and saying, actually, these things, if we think about them from a certain perspective, they do have a lot of weird similarities. So like with Shuba, we have the being both the, which has to be part of a noun phrase for it to make sense as a the equivalent, but it also has its own full life as this and can occur independent. And so... The thing I like about thinking about all of these things as determiners rather than thinking about pronouns and articles and all of this is that it, it makes a lot of sense as something that would otherwise be really confusing and you'd be trying to give it a kind of double identity that's unnecessary. Yeah, and like it's weird to me that determiner is a name for this particular category is actually around 100 years old. It's pretty well established. And it's weird for me that, you know, all through school, I never learned about determiners. I just learned about articles and demonstratives and pronouns and possessive nouns or possessive adjectives or whatever they called all of these individual things. And I didn't learn that there was a, a name for the super category. And like, you can talk about articles separately, like if you want to. But it wasn't until I started doing linguistics that I learned there was actually a name for this whole category, even though this is something that's not controversial among linguists, and it's something that's generally accepted, and you, you know, you walk into Ling 101, and they might start talking about determiners. And it's, it's weird to me that this hasn't necessarily trickled all the way down to kind of high school grammar education or elementary grammar education. It does make me sad you have to wait until you're in a linguistics undergrad class to know that there's even a party going on and the determiners are all there. Yeah. And like, I, I'd studied a bunch of languages and I'd learned, you know, what I thought were my parts of speech. And then I walk in and I'm like, what is this determiner thing? And how is it everywhere? And why is it, <laughs> why is it so cool? So I think people should know about determiners. Uh, I also have some determiner haikus to leave us with. Excellent. Do you want to hear my determiner haikus? Sure. Go for it. Now that we know all about them. Okay. So... This is a multi-authored set of determiner haikus from Tumblr a couple years ago. And the first one is, the best thing about the definite article is that it is the. <laughs> a good thing about indefinite articles is that they are a. Uh, the best thing about using the demonstratives is when you go this. <laughs> that was beautiful. All that my best thing resum those determiners is all the above. <laughs> Thank you for those. I'll link to them on the show notes if you want to reread them and process them. You should definitely do that in case people want to write their own grammar haiku. Um, if you write a grammar haiku, tag us in it and we will retweet it. <laughs> Thank 
For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. And I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistic questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include forensic linguistics, homonyms, navigating linguistics grad school, and our second sweary episode, and you can help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes, or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire, our editorial producer is Emily, and our production assistants are Fabian and Celine. Our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!